Welcome back to Cleveland. This has become some of, something of a second home for you. Home of the Cavaliers, my team, uh, other than the Celtics. <laughs> well, that's okay. We'll, we'll allow that. It was in this city in 1935 that a philanthropist, Edith Annisfield Wolf, started the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards. Uh, since 60, for the past over 50 years, it's been administered by the Cleveland Foundation. Mm -hmm. It, it doesn't have the glitz of maybe the Pulitzers or a National Book Award, but still a very significant award. It used to be known as the Black Pulitzer because so many black people got it. And she created the prize really to honor what we think of as excellence and diversity. And at a time when books about the cultural pluralism of America weren't really being acknowledged and weren't really being honored. It's very rare to have a black Pulitzer Prize winner. Martin Luther King won this prize. Think about that. Exactly. Langston Hughes won this prize. And in many cases before Zora Neale Hurston. In many cases before they were known people too. Sure, know? or and certainly before they were canonized. So this woman, um, Edith Annisfield Wolf, was a poet, a poet who had enough money to endow a prize and enough vision and foresight to endow a prize that stands for cultural diversity and excellence and that is very vibrant today. Let's jump into the one of the first winners that I think a lot of people may know about her work, but not know about her. Mm -hmm. And this would be Margot Lee Shetterly, who everyone knows about the movie Hidden Figures, but they don't know maybe the person who wrote the book. Yeah, the, um, the, mo the, 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 um, the charge that I get each year is calling the winners. Karen Long gives me their contact information. She's the great administrator of the program. And then I have to track them down. And tracking this woman down was crazy. I would get emails from her <laughs> saying, no, I can't talk. I'll talk tomorrow. And I finally said, in the length of time that it's taken you to write these emails, I could have given you some good news. Call me. <laughs> or I'm going to take the money away. No, I didn't say that. But she did. And she was absolutely delighted. And she, of course, is the author of Hidden Figures. And she kind of typifies uh, what, what these awards are about because we're dealing with, with African-American women. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with African-Americans and women, you know, two, two, two groups that uh, are, are looking for more say in the world. Yeah, and what a crazy story. I mean, who knew that I had, I'm, I'm a professor of African and African-American studies. I had, I never heard of these women. I had no idea that anybody black, male or female, was involved with the space program and that um, one of them would be pivotal in John Glenn's decision um, to orbit the Earth. I mean, it's extraordinary. Two of the other winners this year also deal with history, but with a bit of poetic license we made. In one case, literally poetic license. Talk about Tahimba Jess. Isn't that a great name? It is. Tahimba Jess. Eight years in the writing of Olio, which is, um, as um, our press release says, a physical work of art that imagines and reclaims lost African-American performances from the Civil War until World War I. What a great idea, what it, a great It's concept. a fascinating looking book. It's, it's a book to, it's hard even to describe it. It's a book of poetry, but it's, it's dealing with historic figures, musical figures throughout the early history. Mm -hmm. some, some say it's the first, first voices in the post slavery generation, these were people who were able to move out and then become voices, national voices, and yet he weaves this into sort of a fictional account. Uh, amazing. Rita Dove, <clears throat> excuse me, Rita Dove, who of course has won the Pulitzer Prize and is um, the first person I invited to join the reformed jury when I became chair of the prize, said, and I'll quote, this roller coaster melange of poetry, anecdote, songs, interviews, and transcripts which code switches, code switches its way through the briar patch of American history. Now, you can't beat that for a description. And one of this year's fiction winners also name checks real historic figures, uh, telling the stories of the Chinese-American experience. Talk, tell us about Peter Ho Davies. Peter Ho Davies, when I called his wife said, um, this is a nightmare, his wife said, well, he's in immigration. He's just coming home from the East, oh, geez. and we thought, oh my God, you know, well, I hope yeah, he gets through. Give, given and today. He, yeah, given today, and then um, he called and he got through. The um, novel's called The Fortunes. Joyce Carol Oates calls it a prophetic work, and Joyce Carol Oates is tough, with passages here of surpassing uh, beauty. It's got four link sections, and it explores the California Gold Rush, actress Anna Mae Wong, the 1982 murder of Victor Chin, which I remember vividly by disgruntled Detroit auto worker, 
and the contemporary adoption of a Chinese daughter by American parents. So he takes these real figures mm -hmm. and he weaves this kind of fictional story, which tells us a, more about ourselves than we have known probably before. Yep, and he's a professor just like Tahimbe is. Uh, the other fiction, a winner this year, seems like a very timely story of terrorism and how we perceive it oh, and yeah. the personal impact of terrorism. And what a title, The Association of Small Bombs, which quite resonant after the events yesterday at, at Parliament. Uh, Karan Mahajan. Karan Mahajan tells the story of three boys caught in the blast, only one of whom survives. It's a brilliant study of violence and the aftermath of violence. And it's an examination of Punjabi society, which most of us don't know um, anything about. Hindu and Muslim antagonism and the sometimes comic expression of human grievances. Perfect material for art, don't you think? Absolutely. Finally, we have this year's Lifetime Achievement winner, oh. uh, Isabel Allende. How does she qualify in this? You know, I had dinner with her last year. Harvard gave her an honorary degree, and she was at the next table. And uh, she was a goddess. I mean, so I couldn't believe that we hadn't honored her. And um, I happened to, I could claim, I proposed her to the board this year. And I, and I was, I didn't know if she would say, look, I've won all these prizes, I'm too busy to come to Cleveland. And she was so honored. She answered the phone herself. She lives in San Francisco. And she answered the phone herself. And she said that she would basically fax herself to Cleveland to take this award. She has sold more than 67 million books. And, um, and she's from Peru. And I love Peru. I made a documentary series called Black and Latin America for PBS. And one hour is on the black experience in Peru and Mexico. And I bet you didn't even know there was a black experience in Peru. I absolutely didn't. I, I also read that she is the most widely read author writing in Spanish. Yep, isn't that incredible? And she did a TED Talk. 3.5 million people have watched that TED Talk. Incredible. In, in 2009, you inadvertently became part of our national conversation about race. Uh, there was a, a kerfuffle between a police officer in your hometown of Cambridge. No, that's another guy. He looks like Under me. the mistaken impression that you were breaking and entering your own house caused international headlines. <laughs> yeah, uh, President true. Obama uh, hosted a so-called beer summit at the White House between you and the officer. Um, it spoke to a post-racial America that wasn't post-racial yet. Uh, <laughs> where do you think our national conversation about race is right now? I think that <clears throat> this is a golden opportunity for us to have a profound conversation, not only about race, but about the nexus between race and class. I grew up in the hills of West Virginia, where um, people overwhelmingly since 1936 have been voting Democratic until um, Barack Obama. And they definitely did not vote, and they loved Bill Clinton, but did not vote for Hillary Clinton. They voted for Brett, the man who became the president, Donald Trump. And it was not a vote about race, it was a vote about class. It was a vote about the um, diminished expectations, doubt in the future. And I think a lot of people voted for Donald Trump because of that. The idea that you could, like in my hometown, um, get a college education, come back and work at a white collar job in the paper mill, being the son or the daughter of a person who had worked in the paper mill and live in our beautiful little town of Piedmont, West Virginia, on, snuggled in the, the uh, Allegheny Mountains on the banks of the Potomac all the rest of your life and marry the, your high school sweetheart. That's gone. That's over. And a lot of people don't know how to deal with that. And it makes people frightened. And when people get frightened, they look for scapegoats, as we know in American history and world history, all too often. The floorboards of Western civilization, I tell my students, have two streams. One's anti-Semitism, one's anti-black racism. You could add homophobia, you could add sexism. And people lift up the floorboards and dipper out that, um, that hatred when they are afraid economically. And we have to stop talking merely about race and talk about economics and talk about class. More conversation is due, and the Ennisfield Wolf Book Awards help us maybe have that conversation a bit. Uh, Harvard scholar, uh, public intellectual, and uh, PBS genealogist, Henry Louis Gates, <laughs> thank you for joining us today. Thank you, brother, and watch season four in September. You got it.